So we're up to the official class stuff. I just want to mention this Thursday is the job fair. If you're looking for a job, sign up here and tune in there. It's, it's remote. And even if you are, don't think you're ready to get hired right away, I strongly recommend attending because every employer will explain what jobs they have and what skills are needed. So that's useful information. Even if you don't have those skills now, you can learn what classes you should take to have the skills later. And um, if you are unable to get into class security classes you want, please send an appeal letter. I have a sample here to try to remind the administration that they promised to stop cutting our staff so we could teach more security courses, and then they reneged on that and cut the staff anyway. And they really need to knock it off because we have an award-winning security program, and we really, I would like to teach more classes, and uh, we need to keep pressure on the administration to make them do that. Um, all right, and so we're down to 121, which is here. <clears throat> And we're just down to the second chapter. Here's the videos from the first week. If anybody missed them, you can review them there. And we're going to talk about the Windows operating system. So I should be set up here. Here we go. All right. So um, understanding how the operating system stores data is essential for a forensic investigator. Although, to be fair, most forensic investigators don't really understand it. They just use a tool. They believe what the tool tells them. But that is not a good practice because you should be able to explain clearly what it does and understand what the limitations are and be aware that every tool has flaws. And oh, I see some chat in the Twitch. Let me see what's going on there. Um, all right, close down the useless office space. Yeah, okay. Module two quiz is locked. Oh, that's no good. Okay, I'll have to fix that. When do you start the Twitch? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I start, yeah, they're good. People are explaining stuff. Okay, good. Thanks for telling me the quiz is locked. I'll check that after the lecture. All right, um, all right, so anyway, uh, so it's important to understand how things are stored because a lot of it is recovering lost data. So we'll talk about uh, Microsoft's file system. Now, you should understand this allocated storage space is space that is in current use, so it had the file name and a creation date and an owner, and that's called active data. Then there is unallocated space which is leftover data on the drive. Well, it's, it's sections of the drive that are available to store new files, but they often contain fragments or complete old files. And that's the files you recover that from what has been deleted but not yet overwritten. And partitions are regions of the disk that are set aside and in Windows assigned a drive letter typically, like C, D, or E. You can partition your drive into various sections, um, although a lot of people in Windows just have one big partition called C but you can partition it into more chunks if you want to. So a byte is eight bits, and it's the smallest addressable unit of memory, but the smallest amount you can read or write to a hard drive is a sector. You can't read or write less than 512 bytes at a time. So even if you're trying to save one byte, it will have to write 512 bytes onto the disk, even if only one of them matters. And typically, uh, that's clustered together into 4,096 byte clusters, which is the smallest units that's used and tied to a uh, a file name in the master file table. That's called a cluster. Now, disks have bad sectors. All the disks have a failure rate, and modern large disks have a higher failure rate because there's more bytes there. So when a cluster goes bad, it just marks it bad and silently replaces it with some extra clusters. So if you buy a one terabyte hard disk, they really give you more than one terabyte, and your computer does not know this. The drive controller knows that there are extra sectors, and it replaces the bad sectors invisibly with one of the others. So your computer doesn't even know that sector 10,000 is now somewhere else on the disk. Uh, this has some interesting consequences for forensics. One of them is those bad sectors contain data. It's not that they lost all the data. It's that it discovered a read error when reading them, and you can't erase them. When you try to erase the drive from the computer, it writes on every sector it can find, but it doesn't know that some of the sectors have been repointed to other areas, and it can't reach the so-called bad areas. So uh, this is why I mentioned before most corporations will physically destroy storage media rather than trying to clean it. Because you never really know you got all the data off of there. Dirty tricks like this will get you. Even if you run through a program that erases every sector it can find, you didn't really find all the sectors. So anyway, um, a cluster is the logical storage unit, which like I say is typically uh, 4,096 bytes um, on modern hard drives. And your 
files are stored by clusters. So if you store a file that's only one byte large, if it was to be stored in the clusters, which it isn't, it would put one byte and would waste 4,095 bytes. In fact, things less than about 100 bytes are stored in the master file table itself. They don't go to the clusters at all. They store the actual contents of small files with the metadata, like the owner. Anyway, so your hard drive looks like this. You have tracks that go all the way around. You have sectors here, the smallest unit you can read and write, which is 512 bytes. And then you have clusters, which are typically eight contiguous sectors to add up to uh, 4,096 bytes. Is the most, but you can have other sizes if you want to. So an 800 byte file would use two sectors and then have file slack. It would have leftover couple of hundred bytes at the end, which would contain a couple of hundred bytes from whatever previous file had been stored there. So there's fragments of files left over. That file slack part there is typically useless because you don't get a whole file and you don't even get the first few bytes of a file, which would contain the file header. So it's unlikely that you'd be able to use it. You won't be able to reconstruct a visible image or anything. If it was something like a text document or a Word document, you might find a few words in there. And if it happened to be a password or something, that might be nice. But in practice, um, the stuff you get from file slack is pretty useless. The stuff, however, where you find the complete file that's been deleted and you find the whole clusters just sitting there, that can be reconstructed into visible images and Word documents and such. And they're useful, but the problem is you no longer know the owner or the timestamp. So they're not all that useful, but at least you can see what was in the file. So platters are the big flat disk you see here, and modern drives have a series of platters there. But the hard drive controller takes care of all that, and you really don't have to worry about it that much. There's a spindle at the center, and you have these actuator arms with a whole bunch of magnetic read-write heads that ride just a micron or so above the surface of the disk because magnetism, uh, there is no magnetic monopole. The smallest unit of magnetism is a dipole, and that means the power of the magnetic field falls as the cube of the distance. So the only way to put a lot of data on a disk is to move that read-write head very, very close to the disk so it can have a small concentrated magnetic spot. And that's why this is riding on a cushion of air, only a few, like a micron or so above the disk, and so a vibration or dust or anything will cause it to scrape the drive and destroy the drive. That's a head crash. So anyway, it's really got high tolerance. Anyway, so that's a cylinder, is the same track number on every platter, um, although you usually don't worry that much about physically where the data is stored on the disk. <coughs> although, if you go to drive savers, they can actually recover data from a damaged disk they, because they have a huge library of a copy of every disk drive. So they will take a working disk drive and move your platters over or move the electronics over and they have a clean room with the special sticky boots and the vacuum running to suck out all the dust so they can take these things apart in a clean environment like surgery and recover them. So it's expensive, but they can really recover stuff from all kinds of damaged storage units and they have to do it all the time. So anyway, um, now memory is in your RAM chips and if you open more and more windows, eventually you'll fill up all the memory and your computer if it was MS-DOS, it would have stopped to say you've got to go buy more RAM, but modern machines use paging. If you fill it with the memory and you try to open another application, it will take something that's in memory and copy it to a temporary file on the hard drive. That's the page file to free up some room. So that's paging, and it's used by all modern operating systems. And so uh, you can control it. It's called pagefile.sys in Windows. Uh, Windows tech support from Microsoft says, please don't change it, just leave it at the default, let Microsoft handle it. But you can change it. If you go into your advanced system properties, you can change the paging down here. You can change how big it is and where it's stored. Um, but you can't really get rid of it. And Microsoft's Windows is very strange about what it puts in the page file. Uh, I think I told you before, one of my most amazing experiences in forensic is I, we, we ran uh, NCASE on a bunch of machines in the lab. They were brand new machines, and we found in the RAM an email I'd written to my sister two years before in the previous generation of hardware. So somebody had made an image of that machine and used it as the image for the next, and it had taken something from the page file of the old machine and put it in the RAM of the new machine. So Microsoft Windows is very strange. It takes things from RAM and puts them in the page file, and then it takes things from the page file and puts them back in RAM for no apparent reason. Nobody really understands it. But, but the important thing is if you find something in RAM, you don't know when it was put there. It could have come from some 
unbelievably arcane process like this. So you can't just accuse the guy that was logged on today of having put that thing in RAM. It might have come from something long ago by someone else. So uh, you got to know binary, decimal, and hexadecimal so you can understand raw hex dumps and such. And so we'll talk about that with the, uh, with the binary games which we started last time. And so you can identify files by the first few bytes. This is what I was saying. If you don't get the first few bytes of a file, the file becomes almost useless because you can't reconstruct it. So Excel spreadsheets start with this stuff. JPEGs start with FFD8 and they end with FFD9. PowerPoint starts with a different mark. PDFs start with percent PDF. PK zip files start with PK, the initials of the guy that invented it, Phil Katz. Word documents have headers. And tools like uh, Autopsy have all this built into them. This is how they reconstruct a file. If they go to the deleted files, they find some clusters, and they look for the header of a file type they know, and then they look for the footer of that file type to find the end of it, and then they reconstruct images and Word documents and everything out of that. Uh, that's called file carving. All right, so when you boot up a Windows machine, the kernel is the part of the operating system that must be in RAM and it can't operate otherwise. The part that reads the keyboard and draws things on the screen and does things you're doing all the time. So when you first power it on, it goes through a power on self test where it tries to see what hardware is attached because you might have connected different hardware while the power was off. And then it finds some boot up, some storage device like a hard drive that it can boot from. So um, first is the BIOS, basic input output, which finds a keyboard, a display device, and a storage device of some kind. And if it doesn't find those things, it gives up and says, I can't start. Then it boots, runs a small piece of code to boot up. And then um, it uses these days UEFI instead of BIOS, which does the same job, although it has uh, fancy features like uh, encryption to protect the boot up process. Although, by the way, Secure Boot is fantastically messed up and insecure. And if you listen to Paul's security podcast, Paul is an expert on this stuff. It is horrifying how much the secure boot is not really all that secure at all. It involves code that is run with high privileges that is not verified at all. Anyway, they're trying to make it more secure, but the current generation of it has quite a few security flaws. Anyway, um, so the first sector on the hard drive is always the master boot record. This is where it finds standard boot up information and it stores information about the partitions on the disk. This contains the master partition table, which describes what partitions are on the disk, and the master boot code, a disk signature, and the end of sector marker. It's all pretty generic, but that's the master boot record is how on a bootable disk, it has to have an MBR at the start of it. Now, Windows used to use FAT, file allocation table, various versions of this for floppies and small hard drives and bigger hard drives. FAT is not used for Windows anymore. It's only used for removable drives like thumb drives and such. Um, all modern Windows versions, ever since like Windows XP, use NTFS, the new technology file system that Microsoft invented in 1993 to go with Windows NT. Um, FAT was a very limited file system. It was inefficient at using space, and it did not store enough metadata with each file. Files didn't have owners and permissions. Physical access to the drive meant you could actually read and write everything on it. That's all you could do. Um, NTFS has file permissions. A file is owned by somebody and it has a permission table. Everybody has, can read, but only the owner can write and things like that. Um, it also has the ability to compress files. You can use Unicode. You can have long file names. FAT would only let you have the old 8.3 file names. And the access control list I was talking about. It's got a log file and it's got an update sequence number that records when things are changed. Um, it has quite a few control files on an NTFS volume. There's a, a change journal, and there's a journal here. Journaling is really important. If you have a Windows 98 machine, and it crashes with the blue screen of death, which it did quite often, then when it reboots, it will say, recovering lost clusters, and spend half an hour recovering them, because if it was in the middle of saving a file, and it didn't finish, it has no idea where, what was going on. It goes on the disk and it finds there's, there's clusters, I don't know what they are, so it'll sweep them up and put them in the root of C and call them file 0000, file 0001, and this can take a half hour. It's very annoying, and the solution has been known for Linux for a long time, and Microsoft built it in NTFS is journaling. Now, if you save a file on an NTFS volume, it doesn't just write it to the disk, it has a journal. It says, okay, I'm writing this file to here, I'm writing the first sector, I'm writing the second sector. 
I'm writing the third sector, poof, I die. When I come back up, I'll look at the journal and pick up where I left off. This is what I used to do. I used to be a database administrator at a financial company. I was handling hundreds of millions of dollars with these important cases, and the phone would ring, and people say, drop everything, we have an emergency. And then I'd have to take care of the emergency. Then I'd come back, and now I have only one hour to do the thing. So I learned to do the same thing. I wrote down everything I was doing so they could pull me away, and I could come back and pick up where I left off. Um, anyway, uh, the alternative data streams is you can put multiple streams of data tied to a single file name. This is a feature in Windows designed for compatibility with Apple. It was designed for music. So you'd have the sound of the music, and then you'd have the cover art, and then you'd have the album liner notes all tied to the same file name. So a file name is like a directory. It can contain multiple streams of data. Um, all right. And uh, here's more detail. These FAT systems also had limited um, file sizes and, and Drive sizes, all the FAT64 got pretty big. But basically, you hardly need to worry about FAT anymore. Everything is using NTFS. Microsoft has been promising for more than a decade to have a new system more advanced than NTFS, but they finally just gave up on it, and they just stick with NTFS. They've had versions of it with minor changes, but they're still using NTFS for pretty much everything. And in NTFS, the information about the names of the files and the owners and the timestamps and the permissions are all stored in the master file table, and it keeps two copies of the master file table because if that were to get corrupt, your whole drive would become unusable. So um, that master file table is the directory of everything, and it has um, 1,024 bytes for every entry. So there's enough room there to store a lot of information about each file. The DOS only had like 16 bytes to store data about each file, so you really couldn't have much. Here you can have a long table of permissions, and other information about each file. Um, and so you got timestamps. Now you can change the timestamps. You can forge them, but it turns out that some of those timestamps are hard to change. So uh, unless your hacker has pretty good time stomping tools, they tend to create an inconsistent situation among the many timestamps, and it tends to be obvious that the times have been manipulated. Um, all right. And so here's some information. Here's the master file table. Uh, here's the mirror, the second copy of the master file table. There's a log file. There's a bitmap indicating which clusters are used, and other things. These files that start with dollars are the control files for the NTFS volume. They're not things created by the user. They're created by the operating system to organize the data on the disk. Now, the prefetch folder is a feature to make Windows run faster. Uh, Microsoft learned around the time of Windows XP that most people buy a lot of RAM, and they're not really using it all. And on top of that, people have a lot of dead time on their computer. They'll do something like open a web page or an email, and then they'll just read it for five minutes, and all that time, the computer has nothing to do. So they said, we could provide a better experience for our users by when they're not using the computer, we will be preparing things in case they launch them. So we're going to keep track of everything you launch, and whatever you used recently, we're going to preload it in memory so it'll load faster when you click on it. So that's the goal, is to give you a better experience, but it does mean that there's this nice record of the last 128 files that have been launched, and when they were launched and who launched them. Very handy. That's the prefetch folder. And they're stored here. There's a registry key controlling it. And in there, you just find these PF files, which are in a strange Microsoft binary format. You have to use a tool to read them. You can't just open them in Notepad or anything. But there are tools, and it's one of the many things Autopsy can do for you. Vista had something called super fetch files, which was some way to get extra memory from a thumb drive, and I don't think it ever really amounted to anything. Um, shell bags, however, are quite important. Every time you open a window, like I've probably got one open here, there. So I've opened this window here. Here's a window showing it's a certain size, it's a location on a screen, it's in this view and not some other view. Every time you open a window, this information is stored. So when you open this window again, it will remember pop up here, be this size, have this view. That's what the shell bags do. The shell bags record what every Windows File Explorer window was, and therefore, I can tell what windows you had open, where you were going. Um, the shim cache contains information of binaries that were viewed in Explorer but not executed, and it's also used for compatibility. Because Microsoft Windows has lots of backward compatibility. You can run programs that were written for Windows 2000 or Windows XP. It will create an environment that makes it think it's running on XP. And that's got to do with the shim, shimming, they call it. All right, and uh, 
There's a shim cache parser you can use. So again, it's another record of what files have been viewed and what files have been, programs have been launched on the machine. Like I say, this is why if you want to do something on a Windows machine and lie about it, you're in big trouble because it has all these records of what you're doing and none of them were intended to spy on you. There is a service called um, Event Viewer and you can turn on a process called auditing to make a record of what people are doing, but it's not on by default. But even when you are not deliberately auditing, the operating system is keeping all kinds of records of everything you do. And that's why forensic examination is so effective, even on just an ordinary machine that is not intended to keep records at all. So let's try a Kahoot. This is 121 mod 2A, that sounds about right. All right. Oh, and I forgot to check the uh, Twitch comments. Um, I'll do it after the groups, I guess. I'm getting more people physically here this semester. give you an advantage in getting my attention here. I keep forgetting to check the Twitch chat because I don't have two screens. People are answering questions. I see someone uh, doesn't. Uh, yes, you can't sign into the Canvas. You have to create an account. I'll show you after the Kahoot. Good, I see students answering each other's questions. I appreciate that. So which one is 512 bytes? <coughs> All right, that's a sector. Same on floppy disks, too. Been this way for a long, long time. What's the first sector on a hard disk? A bootable one. I guess even the non-bootable ones have to have it. For the partition table. Right, the master boot record. That's the first sector on a hard drive. All right, what file system does Windows use? NTFS, the new technology file system, new as of 1993. All right, so what artifact records recently executed applications? All right, that's the prefetch folder. All right, we record the winners. Oh. 
So there was a question about the, uh, the, the canvas. What you do is you go to, from start at samsclass.info, and you go to the course you're in, and then down here in the quizzes section, it shows you, you enroll here, you'll have to create an account on this server, because it's not the City College server. You enroll here in the course, and then you view the course there. You don't need a join code, but you do need to log in. You need to create an account on this server, using any email you like. And there's a different one of these for each one of my courses. So I hope that helps. Got it, okay, good, good. All right, good, okay, people are answering that question anyway. All right, so let's get back to the, uh, here, all right. So now we should talk about the registry. In the days of MS-DOS, you had these text files like autoexec.bat that contained system settings and there were different ones all over the place and Linux still does it this way. Apache has its own configuration and PHP has its own configuration. And that's the way Microsoft decided they didn't like that. So in Windows 95, they created this thing called the registry, which was a single structure in memory that had all the settings for every part of Windows and every application. It's not stored as one file on the disk. It's stored as Microsoft always is in a very bizarre, illogical way. Um, nine files scattered all over the place. But it's constructed during boot up. And so this keeps track of uh, what's in the registry. And by the way, if you edit the registry, it has immediate effect. It's like going into a car with the engine running under the hood with a wrench changing things. It doesn't have any undo, and it isn't like it doesn't take any effect until you save it. Whatever you change in the registry takes immediate effect. So if you go in the registry and make mistakes, you can easily render your system unbootable. Um, so be aware of that. You don't just casually mess with the registry. So there are five major hives, root hives. HKey classes root contains the file name extension associations. This is a feature of the Windows operating system which is not present in Linux. Everything has a three letter or four letter extension and that extension is tied to a program. This, the, the idea is Microsoft thinks you should be able to double click a Word document and have it open in Word. You don't do that on Linux. But anyway, um, so here's where all those associations are stored. All the file extensions and what program they go to. Um, HKey current user contains the profile for the currently logged on user. So when you boot up the machine and you haven't logged in yet, it doesn't know who the current user is yet, so this hive is not populated yet. It builds the registry in memory as you boot up. So HKey users contains all the uh, personal settings for every user, all their own start menu items, their desktop, background, and all that jazz. And one of these is copied into the HKey current user hive when you log in, once it knows who the current user is. So this is actually a subset of that. These five objects are not remotely independent, and they're not stored as five separate files on the disk. Everything is confusing, and that's the way Microsoft always does everything. HKey local machine contains your hardware settings. So this is built during boot up. When it probes and finds out what keyboard you have, what monitor you have, it stores that information here. So it knows what drivers to load and such. Um, and HKey current configuration has a lot of other information here like screen resolution and font. This is um, global settings that's not tied to the currently logged in user like the clock time zone and things like that. So um, here's what it looks like in uh, in reg edit, you have the five hives and then you, have, you can expand them like folders. They are not folders though, they are a weird data structure and they always have to have a data entry in every one. So you'll see a default with value not set in every one of these things that look like a folder. They can't be empty because they're really just uh, lines in a database. They're not actually folders. So uh, that's a quick overview of the registry and there's a lot of good forensic data in the registry. It's very important, like if somebody's been changing the time to try to confuse the record, you can see the time zone changes in there and so on. So um, here's other features for different versions of Windows. Vista has automatic defragmentation um, and Ready Boost. This was the thing that uh, captured data from the USB drive. You know, it's that important. Um, the shadow copy service is quite important though. This was a feature in Windows 2000 server where it would keep automatic backups of files. So you could go back to old versions of files which turned out to be really useful so they expanded it to the whole drive. The problem is if you delete a file, there's no way to go back to the previous version anymore. So it only prevents, it only helps you get to files that have been overwritten. 
um, to the GUI. However, this does mean if you run a tool like Autopsy, it will find the volume shadow copy backups, and you can find old versions of files in there. So that's often quite useful. And if you're using a tool Autopsy, you might be able to find deleted files there. It's just in the Windows GUI, the way this works is you right-click a file and go to the old versions, but if you deleted the file, you can't find it to right-click on it. But I think Autopsy can still find old versions of files that have been deleted, although I haven't trusted that. And then HiberFile contains um, the contents of RAM when your machine hibernates. Windows 7 added biometric logins, uh, jump lists, which are where you can have a button down here and you can right click it and it'll show you the recent things that are open there. This is in the Mac I'm using here. It's the same feature. They call this jump lists. But what it means is another list of recently opened documents. You can go down here and find an application and when you right click it, you see all the recently opened documents there. So it's another list of what you've been doing. That's like I say, if you've been doing something on Windows and you want to lie about it, you're in big trouble. Unless you wipe the whole hard drive, there are so many lists of what you've been doing that a forensic examiner will very will almost always be able to find out what you were doing. Um, all right, there's Backup and Restore Center, lets you back things up. There's uh, Restore Points, which are based on those shadow copies. You can roll the operating system back to earlier versions. Um, there's BitLocker. BitLocker is Windows built-in file whole disk encryption scheme, and you can encrypt USB drives, but most importantly for a forensic examiner, you can encrypt the whole hard drive. And you should for all portable devices because it might get stolen or lost. But if you do, then if you don't have the key, you're not getting in. There, I knew some of my friends who are professional penetration testers have actually broken into machines that are BitLocker encrypted, but they can only do it rarely and when a significant mistake is made. Normally, the whole point of it is, if it's BitLocker encrypted, you can't get any of the data off that drive, just forget it. And the same thing's true of an iPhone. If you don't have the login, everything on there is encrypted and you can't get in, but what you can get into is the iCloud if they're using iCloud backups, and if people are backing up their Windows machine on Microsoft Azure or something, you can get in that. But uh, as far as the hard drive itself, if you don't have the, uh, the login, you're probably not getting in anything with BitLocker, unless you have the recovery key. Anyway, um, USB devices have timestamps and metadata, so that can help you uh, see what people have been storing on there. Uh, there's touch screens out there. And there's something called sticky notes you can use to put notes on the machine. I'm not sure how much people really use that. Here, by for example, is where it stores the hive files. In C Windows System 32 config, our system, SAM, security, and software, these contain uh, global settings for the machine. And in particular, they contain all the password hashes for all the passwords on the machine. So hackers learn to reconstruct the password hashes here and then pass it into hacking tools like John the Ripper to crack Windows passwords. Um, then, once you log in, each user has their own ntuser.dat file. This is where your personal settings are stored. And uh, so, that's, this is one you often look in for forensic evidence. Event Viewer is Microsoft Event Logs. The purpose of Event Logs is to diagnose a problem with the machine, but it does record everything that's been happening, every application that's launched and things like that. A lot of information in Event Log, it's extremely chatty. Um, when I teach Splunk, we find out about this. Just open a folder and open a notepad document, and this creates like 100 events. It's ridiculous. Um, but there is information there. It just can be a matter of wading through a mountain of junk to find the information you need. And your web browsers, of course, keep track of the history, and they store copies of images from pages and the cache and all kinds of things. Now most of them have private browsing, and that means they don't store as much on the disk. So if people use private browsing, there's less of a trail in the web browser. But still, you can find out a lot of what people have been doing there. And if you hear um, computer crime news reports, they often say this person's internet search history was this, because it's in the web browser. Like there was a woman that was accused of poisoning her husband. And like the week before, she was on Google saying, how do you poison your husband? You know, which is evidence that comes up in court. Um, files are grouped together in modern Windows systems. Um, just to irritate you as far as I can tell. Um, and <clears throat> they can query external files. And Windows 8, the big thing was they took away the start button and drove everybody nuts. Um, but Windows 10 is the next big hit. We're all pretty used to this. You have the Edge browser replacing Internet Explorer and Cortana, if anybody's using that. I think Microsoft actually finally just abandoned it. Um, anyway, and then Windows 11 has a few new features too, uh, but nothing terribly significant. Anyway, 
there's a quick overview of the main features in various versions of Windows. Now let's try another Kahoot, which would be this one. Anyway, like I say, this class is much easier than it used to be because Autopsy does all the work for you. It retrieves all this stuff and lays it out so you can find it. Um, before, you had to understand this in much more detail and run separate tools to reconstruct the shim cache and everything. Now, you have an all-in-one solution that just does it for you. And like I say, it's good to understand what it's doing so you can have a clue when it goes wrong. Remember this, none of your tools are perfect, they will all make mistakes. So anything important, you should verify it with a second tool. Like just a raw hex editor to just see exactly what's on the disk. This is one way to make sure something is there and properly interpreted. I've seen, in case, get the wrong timestamp on things and things like that, which is pretty bad, you know. All these tools have bugs and they make assumptions. And sometimes they're wrong. That's why one of my trainers, he said, um, when you go to court, they'll ask you, what tool did you use? And his answer was always, I verified everything with multiple tools, so it doesn't matter what tool I used. That's a good answer, as long as you can back it up. Because uh, this is what Encase tries to tell you. If you they say Encase has a reputation, tell them you use Encase and they'll believe you in court. But uh, the open source guys, like the guy that taught me, even writes his own tools, uses open source products, and he doesn't have to defend them. He says, I use multiple tools. What I found is really there. Any competent examiner using any tool will find this. And as long as you can back it up, that's a good answer. Yeah. Uh, Yes, uh, the profiles, yeah, the profile is your, your user folder with the ntuser.dat in it, and it was a real common issue in earlier versions of Windows. It would get corrupted, and you have to regenerate the profile. It still happens with roaming profiles that are stored on servers in Active Directory domains. So that's that. That's just the location for your personal files. Your profile is corrupt, yes, especially in Active Directory domains. And there's Microsoft has recommended procedures to regenerate a profile. Yeah. That's right. That's what you do. You rename the old profile, then you make a new one, and then you can copy files over. Yeah, that's the, I remember doing this. Very common in, in domain environments. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, take a look at this stuff. Okay, which hive contains your current desktop settings? It's in HK current user which is stored on the disk as ntuser.dat. It has to know who's logged in to know what background and settings to use. All right, which artifact contains copies of all or part of a volume? By the way, it's called a shadow copy because it can copy a file while it's in use, which is a pretty new thing. When I used to work at a financial company years ago, I had to go around and turn off all the machines before we would copy things because it wouldn't copy anything that was in use. And the volume, this shadow copy, defeated that problem. You can now copy a file while it's in use. All right. So which feature encrypts a hard drive? Real important for forensic examiners. If the drive is encrypted, you're not likely to get anything from it. Oh, 
What's that? TrueCrypt is just the open source equivalent, yeah. Yeah. And in Apple, it's File Vault. They all do essentially the same thing. Although technically, TrueCrypt was deprecated. They quit developing it when Microsoft brought out BitLocker, but then they made VeraCrypt, which is the continuation of it. Yeah. But they all do essentially the same thing. Unless somebody has left the key line around somewhere you can steal it, you're pretty much toast. All right, which hive contains file name extension associations? HKey classes root. And by the way, I should say, the FBI makes a big deal about this going dark problem. They talk about encrypted messengers and encrypted hard drives and say the data is vanishing, but the privacy advocates say that's not true at all. Because even though people are now encrypting their phone and their computer, they're also buying all these IoT devices, cameras and everything, and they're all storing data. So in fact, the actual amount of plain text data you can find is growing and growing. And uh, that's a pretty good argument, I think. Um, in fact, uh, even though some of the data is hidden behind encryption, there is so much more data. Like the average American, I think they get photographed 150 times a day just from people's cameras on the street and everything. There's so much data. Anyway, it is an issue, though. The encrypted volumes, you usually can't get into them at all unless you can uh, find some way in. Like if it's biometrics, you can take the guy's finger and put it on there, but you know. Unless you have some way to decrypt it, you're pretty much toast. Right, Susanna. Good. Okay. I think that's an accurate representation of the situation. No H. All right, good. All right, so I'm going to stop this recording.